Prime Day is coming July 16th and 17th with epic deals exclusively for Prime members. You'll feel like you just won an award. Oh, wow, I didn't even prepare a speech. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to thank my family for always needing stuff. Uh, also, Sam, my delivery guy, for bringing all my awesome deals so fast. You're the man, Sam! Shop deals on electronics, home, and more this Prime Day, July 16th and 17th. Tastemakers in the watch game like Gear Patrol have called their ceramic watch material almost magical and deemed their adventure-ready Cali Diver Automatic GMT the best sub-$500 dive watch, full stop. It's our friends at Movement. A Movement watch is built to run with precision, purpose, and X factors needed to make the best of the time you keep. From their best-selling automatics to innovative ceramics to more clean, inspired designs. Find your new movement now at MVMT.com. That's MVMT.com. This episode is brought to you by the 10th Annual Whistleblower Summit and Film Festival. The Whistleblower Summit and Film Festival brings together filmmakers from all around the globe to share the impactful and harrowing corruption cases that span industries and governments alike. Led by whistleblower, documentarian, author, and Make It Podcast guest, Michael McRae, the Whistleblower Summit and Film Festival screens the work of these brave filmmakers and helps them navigate the often lonely and dangerous world of the whistleblower. And this year will be no different. With more films, forums, breakouts, and panels than ever, this year's summit is poised to be the best of them all. Beginning July 22nd and running through July 31st, registration and tickets to this year's festival can be purchased at www.whistleblowersummit.com. And registration is entirely free. I'll say that again. Registration is completely free. With all the screenings and panels being virtual, the barriers to getting involved are all but removed. So, Go to www.whistleblowersummit.com to register for free, and you won't regret it. Again, go to www.whistleblowersummit.com and join us at the Make It Podcast and Bonsai Creative in attending what is rapidly becoming the most important festival in the United States for the cause of liberty. That's www.whistleblowersummit.com to register free today. This episode is brought to you by Indie Insights. Indie Insights is our bi-weekly newsletter and love note to the film industry, movies, and the creatives that make them, not to mention you, our esteemed listeners. Inside, you'll find curated industry trends, articles, exclusive commentary, and underappreciated films from filmmakers like you worldwide. And the best part is that it is completely free. So join today at www.bonsai.film. It takes just a few seconds. And once you sign up, you'll get the very next newsletter on Friday morning. It's that simple. Go to www.bonsai.film to get Indie Insights, our biweekly newsletter, and join a network of film creatives just like yourself. And don't worry, we'll never sell your information or spam you with a bunch of nonsense emails. Just the bi-weekly film industry goodness you need. And if you ever tire of Indie Insights, simply unsubscribe. No gimmicks, no games. So go to www.bonsai.film to get Indie Insights for free. to Make It, a podcast by Bonsai Creative that helps creatives in film get where they're going faster by sharing the advice, knowledge, and insights of professional creatives across the film industry. I'm your host, Chris Barkley. Hi, 
I'm Amy Prenner. I'm the founder of the Prenner Group. We've been in business since 2007. I'm proud to say that uh, 2022 marks 15 years of being in business. We specialize in public relations, strategy, media relations, crisis communications, talent relations, red carpets, celebrities, feature films, television, and streaming content. Right now, I am released a film about um, Alzheimer's, and it's gotten, it actually got attention this week from the Academy asking us to submit. So that's pretty cool. It's a documentary feature that's been released in select um, markets. I have also worked on everything from Wheel of Fortune to the Ellen DeGeneres show to um, Parks and Recreation, Parenthood, The Office, and America's Got Talent. Amy Printer, welcome to the Make It Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I'm super, super excited for this. You have been doing this for a couple of decades. You know where all the bodies are buried. And you <laughs> um, have so much to share with this audience. Um, first off, uh, what is the name of the documentary? The name of the documentary is called Have You Heard About Greg? And it's the story of a 70-year-old man who got diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's at 58. And now, 12 years later, he is battling Alzheimer's and um, prostate cancer. And it runs in his family. And it's really interesting. It's an irreverent, um, humorous look at somebody who is going through sort of um, a very challenging time in their life. And there's um, some of the subjects interviewed include um, the author of the book, Still Alice, Lisa Genova, Gen Genovese. I always butcher her name, so that's my fault. Um, and that's the feature film that in 2015, Julianne Moore won an Academy Award for. So this um, has, this film has a lot of, has a lot of credibility, which is really cool. It sounds amazing. I was at Indy Memphis last year and there was, um, a secret screening. And so no one knew what they were watching in the theater and it was Gaspar. That's Nose. so weird. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's interesting. That. Well, they make sure you get a lot of liquor before you do that too. And <laughs> so also very smart, but, uh, it ended up being Gaspar Nose vortex, which is a similar situation where you have a, a woman who's going through dementia, early onset Alzheimer's and how this plays out in her family, because, um, she's very much been like sort of the rock of the family doing all the things. Uh, so, uh, highly recommend, have you heard about Greg? And then also check out vortex as well. I, I, I do want to give this audience a, a little bit more on you. Uh, you did a great okay. job sort of pitching yourself as I should expect, but I just want this audience to know just how deep the rabbit hole goes with you. You mentioned a few things you've worked on in the past. Uh, your clients have won Emmys. They've won Academy Award nominations, high profile accolades. Um, you've worked with epics, AMC network stars, sci-fi G GSN Freeform, travel channel, USA networks, and fuse. You've worked many, on many, Emmy more. Cam many more <laughs> Emmy campaigns for NBC uh, hits such as the office parks and recreation and America's got talent. I mean, the list really goes on and on. I really, there were so many clients that it would seem sort of ridiculous to kind of just list them off, but I want to give the audience a sense of your gravitas. And, um, I'm actually really excited about this thing that you're doing with Jennifer Lopez, with the, with the rollout of Nouveau TV, the uh, English speaking Spanish television network. That's going to be really well, cool as well. That actually happened in 2014. Uh, she became chief creative officer of this network called Nubo in 2013. And um, I worked with her for about two years on it. Um, unfortunately that relationship dissolved um, by oh, no. 2015 and, um, the network actually got sold to another group and now it's called fuse. Oh, so Nubo is fuse. Okay. Sweet. Sweet. 
I have down here on the note that it's 2014. Yeah, I have 2014 down here, but I didn't know what the outcome of that was. So thank oh, you for okay. thank you for telling me that. Okay, that's pretty okay. cool. And yeah. uh, <laughs> I'm sorry that the relationship dissolved well, as it did. You know what? That's entertainment, my friend. And the one thing I can tell you that I've been I've been in the business for 27 years, and when I started. All I wanted to do was be a news anchor. That was all I aspired to do. I graduated college early. I went around the country, like with my makeshift audition tape and wearing my suit. And I really wanted to do it. And what I came to realize is that I kind of enjoyed the process of getting there more than being, you know, being the star. And it was very competitive. It still is. It's a, it's changed a lot. And I really enjoyed and I had a lot of empathy for people that were trying to find those types of jobs because I had gone through it myself. So I ended up going to work for an agent that repped those types of personalities. Who would have thought that that would have shaped my entire career because the basis of what I, a lot of what I do is I put people on TV and I put people on new, new shows. So not, I, you know, the, the beauty of what I do is I don't just do one thing, number one, but number two, I always say this in um, a lot of my documents um, when I, when I'm sending out, you know, proposals and, and kind of roadmaps of what I want to do. I'm a publicist, but I think like a producer, I look at the big picture. You tell me that we have an end date. I want to figure out how we're going to get you there, but I also want to be very strategic about it. And I want to orchestrate a campaign that you know, where we can have a dialogue and we can educate more people and we can work with, with heads of news organizations and, um, and editors and reporters and on-camera talent so that they can help get a message out. And a lot of people just, you know, type a press release, send it out and hope for the best. That doesn't work anymore because there's so many different means of communication. Um, there's social media, there's texting, there's, um, you know, audible, there's podcasts, there's, you know, there's just a lot of ways to get information. And so if you do have something to say, you have to actually have a plan these days because otherwise, um, and you have to look at the landscape and see what's going on. I mean, you wouldn't want to announce a major event if, we knew Joe Biden was going to call a president Biden was going to call a news conference. It just doesn't make sense. So you have to sort of know what's going on around you, read the room a little bit. And so that you have that, um, you have that window and that way you can be strategic and you also can't do it all at once. You can't just call up a publicist, um, a week before an event and say, I have an event and, and, uh, Harry Styles is going to perform <laughs> need to turn this around tomorrow. Like it just doesn't work that way. There's too many, there's too many news outlets when it is a piece of mainstream news mm-hmm. that will get upset and feel like you forgot about them. And they'll remember the next time you have something that's a little lower hanging if that makes any sense. It it does. And I think you're absolutely correct about the press release. I mean, when our feature, we have three feature films and distribution. And when we got those press releases, I mean, on the first one, we were really excited. And then you realize that's just to stroke your ego a little bit. Um, it, It really didn't move the needle for us whatsoever. It's just like the thing that the producers and directors can show their moms and their friends and family and say, yeah, this movie really happened, but I, there's so much to dig in there. I want to go back to the beginning with you because, um, you did find this career path and it's a bit interesting because you grew up with a father who was a pediatrician and mom worked in the office, sister ended up in the medical field. How did you end up being a, 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 a publicist? Well, it's funny. I, um, when I was growing up, I always loved the news. I always loved to know what was going on. And I've taught classes about this, um, in, you know, throughout the last 15 years. And one of the things I always tell people 
is you have to find a way to find your passion and not to be spiritual. That's not what I mean, but more Mm -hmm. once upon a time, there was a place called the newsstand and, you know, they still kind of exist in like a Barnes and Nobles, uh, you know, or like at an airport, you can see like a little bit of it as, as opposed to like what you used to see. But I, I, the, the piece of advice I, um, and I sort of adhered to this and it, kind of carried me to where I am now is I would go to a newsstand and kind of see where I would gravitate towards. Did I like the national news? Did I like the, the, the fashion? Did I like the architecture? Did I like food? Did I like travel? Did I like celebrity? What was it that I liked? And I found that constantly I was fascinated by entertainment and gossip and, and, and feature films and, and television shows and all those things. So that's where I gravitated. Mm. And, um, and so I, um, went to school in Boston. I went to Boston university and I, um, discovered communications and I just like, it just felt like such an organic fit from the get go. Mm. Um, when we had assignments in school about, you know, you know, coming up with a news story about something or, or writing a script or whatnot. I was so into it, but when it came to like, you know, social studies or human, you know, like humanities or chemistry, I was like, this is so not my world. And I don't tend to own that whatsoever. So I think it's, um, it's kind of, you know, one of those things where you have to have a little bit of self-discovery and figure out where your passion lies. And, that little newsstand experiment used to be my go-to because for, and I would tell college kids getting out of school, the same thing, because you don't even know you're, you're so busy studying and trying to get to the finish line that you don't really know what you like half the time. Mm-hmm. So, um, it's kind of a, a, it's a, it's a helpful observation, I think. Yeah. And I, you're a woman of my own heart. I went to school for journalism as well at middle Tennessee state university. And, uh, which is an accredited program that basically uses Columbia as a cur- uh, curriculum. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. So it was a great program, but I found that I didn't like that in, in the, in the stuff I would write, the editor would be able to change anything they wanted to change. And that was their right to do so. I suppose my name would still be on the byline. And then I also just kind of liked the story element of writing. And, and I didn't get that in what I was doing. Now I know that life is stranger than fiction, but at the time it, I didn't see it that way. So I, I'd always just yeah. lean back towards storytelling. I, I am curious from your perspective, um, if you think that curated publicity is a form of journalism. What do you mean by curated? Like paid? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess paid and 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 well, sort of put you know, together will, by you. Oh, I mean, I'm all about working as the team. Um, if the if you know most. PR firms have a team, you know, Mm -hmm. that's the structure of it. So, um, I think that if you, the more collaborators you have invokes different ideas and those ideas will actually create a better, um, story. And, you know, it can't just be like, I'm a dentist. I, 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 I treat celebrities like Lady Gaga, like that's not a story. There has to be a call to action. So, um, And as the, the, you know, especially in the last two years, the way that we consume our content keeps changing and evolving, as you know, um, for the first, for the better part of the first year, we were home and watching more content and listening to more podcasts and watching local news. And so there was an opportunity, um, and that opportunity was, um, the platform we're speaking on now, Zoom. I mean, it had such a a moment in the spotlight, if you will, and it still does. It's created a new office model and a new structure for us to communicate and for us to work with clients. I have never been more successful personally um, from the last two years because of Zoom. Mm. Most of my national and regional interviews have been done this way. I've been able to book clients that have had, that can't travel, that are confined to wheelchairs, like from zoom, because of the fact that 
you know, this is the way we are supposed to be talking to each other right now. Right. And while it's kind of futuristic, it kind of feels also like a natural progression to where we're supposed to be. And, um, it really feels like we're connecting everybody across the globe. So local news is becoming a little bit, um, harder and more challenging, you know, as we're coming out of this pandemic and people don't want to be on a screen like this. And, you know, whereas for me, it was a benefit because I was able to tap into markets that I never would have been able to do. And in public relations specifically, um, when an, an actor, an author, an expert, somebody has something that they're trying to promote. We always recommend satellite media tours, which means that you, um, are in a studio and you're talking on a, an IFB, which is like a little earpiece Mm -hmm. and the control room says, Amy, you're on with Washington, DC, Amy, you're on with New York city, Amy, you're on with, and those are extra, um, you know, external opportunities that, um, are paid for, but you can hit all these markets where during the pandemic, you could do it for free, um, and not have to hire a company. But now as we're coming out of it, these local markets are like, Oh my gosh, we're in so much trouble. People are watching their news on their phone and they're not watching it on their sitting stuck at home on their couch we have to charge for each segment. So oh. there are places that will start to charge you to be on TV, to, which is a shame because it's news and it shouldn't have to be that way. But well, that was kind of the um, question is, 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 is this considered news to you? Like when you work with a client, are you trying to create pieces that feel like news or feel like I'm trying to, what I use the very first thing I usually do, believe it or not, the very first thing I do is I say, what's your end goal or when does the film come out or, um, when is the book being published or when is the conference or when is the event? And then I like to work backwards Mm. because then I can look at the calendar and, you know, I know that red carpet reporters need at least, you know, they like at least a week's notice, but two weeks is better. Um, so that they can get permission to have a position on a red carpet. I know that, if I want to be in a weekly publication, which by the way, those are sort of obsolete as we both know, um, <laughs> like an us weekly or an okay, or an in touch or people, I need to give those people at least three weeks notice so that they can assign it to somebody and that we can be on their radar. And then same with, um, like an access Hollywood, if we want those people to come to come to our premiere or our award show or whatnot, I have to back it up and give them as much notice as possible. And so there's the strategy that kind of comes with that. And that's usually, you know, announcing it. And I usually try to announce one specific set event or said premiere. Um, I actually have one coming out in about two hours. I'm working on a new movie with Hillary Duff's sister. Her name is Haley Duff. She's pretty Mm -hmm. well known. She's a chef. She's an actress. She's a producer. Um, and I will tell you what it is because it'll be, um, it will be announced very shortly. It's called the wedding pack Two, the baby packed, and it's going to be premiering, um, exclusively, um, on demand, um, and on video on demand, like Amazon and Apple and stuff like that. It's called the baby pack Two. I mean, I mean the wedding pack I'm talking so fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so we are announcing that today and we, so how it works just to give you an example is we are announced. I wrote the press release, um, for the partner and they made their changes. We got the poster and the trailer so that they'll run that as well. And it will go on deadline, which is one of the biggest publications in entertainment yep. um, at 10 o'clock Pacific. And then I usually take the release and on, on that Monday, I'll go wide so that I can kind of penetrate the marketplace and get an extra reach. So that's, that's usually what I do. And, um, I'm curious, then I'm curious though, use Amy, that as a tool. Yeah, absolutely. I, but, but I'm curious too, how, um, by the way, congratulations. That's super exciting. I can't wait, but I'm curious how your job differs uh, when you are working with a business client versus an entertainment personality. 
Okay. Well, that was, there was your, that's your entertainment example, business client. I have those too. So I'm working with an immigration attorney right now and she, um, is from El Salvador and she can speak to a lot of different, um, through a lot of different lanes. Mm. So usually what I like to do with somebody like this, especially when they're a new client, we haven't worked together before is I like to first, I, I recommend some media training. And what I mean by media training is I work with a coach that, um, teaches people how to speak in sound bites. Remember when you're on TV, you've got three minutes to say a heck of a lot of stuff. Right. So how to kind of shorten it and sweeten it up a little bit and then get the messaging out there. So that's usually the first thing I do. The second thing I do is I look at their materials and, um, I try to call through them to find a couple of things that, um, so we can get a couple of, of shorter, uh, you know, faster opportunities, um, so that we, we can kind of have some proof of performance to show other outlets. So I usually reach out to some, um, some people that I work with all the time, a splash news, um, a a medium or authority just to kind of get the the client to understand the process. Um, and then I, I try to get them on like one business television show so that they can kind of, I usually try to get them at least three things in the beginning so that they understand that what the cadence is. And then as you know, like for, especially for this immigration attorney, like Juneteenth is coming up, like there's gotta be things she can speak to on that. I just need to have a little brainstorm with her and then I can pitch it out for June. Yeah. I think they moved Juneteenth this year because of father's day. Oh, they did. Yeah. So it's like the Monday after that Sunday. So that well, father's day can still be like, on that Sunday. Again, which, prime example know. that like that helps. Time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, if you're a young first time client, what are the key factors to consider uh, in choosing a publicist? First time clients, first time clients, um, expectations are the most important thing. You know, once upon mm. a time when I first started doing this many years ago, everybody would say, I want to be on Oprah. I just want to be on Oprah. That's all I want to do. Um, then I've arrived. Well, Oprah has been off the air since 2011. Then they would say, (laughs) I want to be, I just want to be on Ellen. And then they would still, the ones that didn't, that were sort of five years behind Ellen before as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, but the ones that, um, or don't really understand how the process works would always say something to the effect of, um, I still want to be on Oprah. <laughs> and it's like <laughs> Viola Davis was just on Oprah. And it's like, yeah, if you're Viola Davis, you're going to get an invitation to be on Oprah, but yeah. for the most part. So, um, it's, it's a little bit, you know, for the, 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 the younger and kind of, you know, on the rise type of personalities, you sort of have to exp- explain how it works and manage the expectations. And, you know, the truth is like, even if I've, and I've done a lot of PR for, um, actors and actresses and, um, talent, we call it. And, you know, the, 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 especially people that are super, super unknown that nobody have ever worked with before. The first thing to do is to get them out there, um, to put them on red carpet so that all the photo agencies know who they are. Because as soon as the photo agencies know who you are, then you will become more recognizable and, you, you know, and, it, and personal publicity also like it works in hand in hand with your social media. Like if you have a decent, if you can grow your followers while you're kind of on the rise, then, that actually helps your chances with being on main in, in mainstream publications and also on talk shows. Those producers look at everybody's social media now. So that begs the, the question, Amy, at what point in an artist's career should they even approach or consider hiring a publicist? Are there, well, are there I mean, benchmarks I mean, you can point out to this audience sure. and say followers at this level income at this level? What do you think? I think the most important thing before you engage a publicist is, um, to work internally. And when you can't do everything, you know, I always say, especially like you're a filmmaker, I can say this to you. You can't be the butcher, the baker and the candlestick maker forever. You can't be the PA, the accountant, the, um, the screen screenwriter, the, the camera guy, the sound guy, the craft services. You can't do all that. Eventually you have to, as you grow, you have to delegate it out. And the same thing, 
is goes for, you know, kind of growing a brand organically, um, as an actor, as a filmmaker, if you had, um, a product, you know, if you were, you know, so it's the same idea for anything. The first thing you have to do is create your logo, create your website, create your, your online presence. And then the second thing you have to do is, um, establish your social media and figure out where you belong. If your audience is the over 50, um, audience, you should be on Facebook. If you're under 50, you should be on Twitter and TikTok and Instagram. Um, so know your audience. And then before you even start talking to a publicist, what I've always found is start creating, you know, and, and, you know, what are, depending on what, what, who the, the, the client, the client will be, (laughs) I usually suggest, you know, like, let's say it's a, um, I'm trying to think something out loud here. Let's see on the fly. Let's say it is a, uh, I'm just trying to think of something quickly. Um, let's say it's a medical book, a book Mm -hmm. about, um, um, uh, I had a client, I'll give you an example. He was a, one of the producers of law and order. And he mm-hmm. wrote a book about one of the largest medical malpractice suits in U S history. And so before, you know, as we were ramping up, I, the first thing I told them to do was we, you, you know, how films have trailers, books mm-hmm. have trailers now. So, and we use that as background for when there's an interview that happens, the producer can use the B roll of the, um, from the, the book trailer to accompany the story. So, um, that's important, but you know, the other thing is, you know, that we had a social media person and what the social media person was charged with doing was following other people that have gone through this. So looking at what the goal is for each respective project and then finding people to follow with similar likes and then commenting about them. Or if a news piece came out about medical malpractice, like we want to flag that and we want to follow the reporter. We want to follow the story. We want to post about it because that engages followers. And even though I'm not a social media, um, you know, person by trade, I do know how to advise on it strategically because what I do know from big picture land is that if you don't have a strategy, it will, you know, like there's no point in having anybody help you. And I, you know, I, the reason why I personally like find my challenges with social media is because it's a time suck and it's more time that I don't have. I don't have time to just sit on my phone and scroll through things. I want to get my stories out, but that's why I always say, if you're, before you engage a publicist, let's like, let's talk about your social media. Let's talk about like, how are you being viewed right now to the outside world? And what do people, what are people's impressions of you now? Um, and once we have that piece of the puzzle, then we can kind of determine, um, what the needs are. And usually I, and I've said this to people, you know, and sometimes they listen and sometimes they don't, but I say, you know, why don't you call me after you get a couple thousand followers, just so we have something to work on. We need a basis. And then once we have that, then we can kind of move things down the, down the line. Yeah, totally, totally agree. And I think the doing branding and marketing ourselves, bringing in that social media guru, you're right. There has to be like a smart goal around it. It has to be specific. It's not just like Mm -hmm. get on social media and shoot a shotgun at it. Like it's really critical that, that you use. And when I say smart goals, it's, it's an acronym. It's a known acronym in in business and a specific, um, forgetting all the letters, but it came to mind when, when you talked about just go follow these people who have experienced what this has happened in this, um, uh, in this book. The other thing that happens too, when you sit down with someone and you try to figure out their baseline of social media followers is that you kind of understand, like you said, what their brand is. So Mm -hmm. how can I form a strategy if I don't understand how the market sees you, views you and embraces you or doesn't embrace you and where they don't embrace you. So that's really wonderful feedback. The great thing about having you on is the depth and reach of your experience. And you have something that cannot be paid for, which is perspective. 
So <laughs> how has the industry changed in the last 20 years? Are you kidding me? It changes every hour. Uh, I mean, it, it changed <laughs> from two years ago. I mean, one of the things I always, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll guest teach classes here and there. And mm-hmm. the last class I guest taught, I was right before the pandemic. And I, I said to somebody, I said, where were you when, uh, how did you find out about how Whitney Houston died? Mm. And I went around the room and, um, and this was, like I said, like about two years ago. And some people said, you know, I heard it on the radio. Some person said, I got a text message. One person said, um, I saw it on, um, Facebook. One person said, I, I'm, I get Perez Hilton's feeds. One person said, you know, like, so there was a different plethora of knowledge compared to when I asked the question, uh, um, a couple of years prior to that, how did you find out about Michael Jackson dying? And most people said they saw it on the news. Mm. So the point of the exercise is to show you that, that, it's constantly changing. I mean, the way we're getting information now is constantly changing and it's a race. And because of it, it has changed the course of how we consume our news. This is, you can't see it, but this is the LA uh, for the audience. She's, she's holding up a copy of the Los Angeles times. This is archaic. This is old that, you know, and I'm sure in most markets, this happened during the pandemic they cut the paper from like a big fat paper to like mm-hmm. nothing. There was yep. no sports in it. There was barely any entertainment in it. And it just, it really shifted the way, you know, and it kind of drew a line in the sand to me because it showed people that people are not absorbing their content the way that they did yeah. even four years ago, five years ago. So um, that being said, I think that, you know, you have to like, depending on who it is, like I said, a couple of minutes ago, you got to know who your audience is. Like, who are you targeting? Are you targeting sports people? Are you targeting entertain, you know, um, movie people who are going to the movies today? Are you targeting people who are moms and they're looking and this product could be amazing and we can take our kids to it. What, first of all, you have to know who your audience is, and then you can figure out the best place to, to give people news because the truth is most of my clients and this is a a high class problem, but a good problem. Like, but what I've noticed consistently, they all love being on TV and they all want to be on TV all the time. And I've done a a number on that because I've spoiled them rotten by getting them on so much TV, especially during the the course of the last couple of years, because everybody is um, doing it virtually. So it's a lot more efficient to get, more people on the news. Right. That's interesting. And so much to dig into there. Uh, I want to go back to the beginning of the comment and spark this thought about sort of crisis management uh-huh. and crisis cases without naming any names. What's been your sort of toughest uh, job as a, as a publicist over your career and, what would you say is your crowning achievement in terms of what you were able to achieve for your client? So it's kind of a two-parter. Okay. The, what's been the toughest and what's been the crowning achievement? Oh, well, I, I will name names because, um, I can now. Awesome. Um, but <laughs> I, um, I was doing handling, um, show publicity for Ellen DeGeneres. Mm-hmm. And at the time, she was, um, embroiled in a couple of controversies, but one of the biggest controversies she was embroiled in was that involved pet adoption. And I think it actually changed the way we see how, um, you know, like you've seen the hashtag adopt, don't shop. Um, we've seen, you know, people, um, are not into people going to the pet store and get getting an animal now because of this. So what happened was Ellen, um, had a dog, she had adopted a dog and she gave it to somebody else. Hmm. And that person wasn't really treating, I, I, you know, it's so funny. It's been so long it's over 15 years ago, but, um, that, that animal got, she gave it the, the, it was supposed to be for her, the mm-hmm. dog, and she gave it to someone else. 
And when the adoption agency went to check on it, the dog wasn't there and it stirred up all this controversy and it wow. invoked a lot of conversations about pet adoption, pet care, et cetera. And it put her in hot water because it made it look like they painted her in a, in a corner, um, which they do do with a lot of celebrities. And what I mean by that is, you know, you're, you get in trouble because your name's on it. Yeah. And so, um, and what, when I was working for her, one of the hard, one of the biggest things that I learned is, um, and I also learned this from Oprah because I had met with her people about potentially working for her. Um, anything that they, when they're filming their show, whatever comes out of their mouth, that's going to get picked up by all the media outlets in the world. So, um, the strategy was to make sure that whatever was being conveyed, um, was, you know, had a cause and effect, you know, because of what she did, um, and, and her decision to pass something off and the perception of it and the way it looked to everybody else Mm -hmm. was bad. So we had to sort of spin it. So, you know, she started making pet donations. She started to, um, she signed a deal with a pet food company as an ambassador. Like, so we had to sort of spin it around. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it took a long time for her to not be known as the woman who gave away the dog. Yeah. Um, so I'm not, I'm not claiming to that was to be a successful campaign. It was a very challenging campaign because of the fact that anytime she would open up her mouth, people would be heavily influenced by what she would do, what she would say and how she would say it. Yeah. Um, but I will say to you, I've done crisis communications for other, um, entities, including, um, Santa Monica, uh, Santa Monica city college, um, the, the head of the organization had administered pepper spray. Um, and when there was some, there was some protesting Mm -hmm. and I was brought in to advise them on what to do. And what I ended up advising them to do is, um, because the cameras were everywhere and whatnot, and they didn't have the right media training. So we worked on statements and it was a different kind of crisis, obviously, but we worked on statements And we would, that would be our only way of communicating because otherwise, I mean, and especially now with social media, you know, one tweet can go the wrong way. So we have to be really careful about that um, and be really strategic, quite honestly. So, um, though, you know, in those more corporate environments, we would put together statements so that people would, um, kind of follow that roadmap and they would be internal statements as well as external. What would you do for Will Smith or Alec Baldwin? Maybe first two things. Here you go. Will Smith or Will Alec Smith? Baldwin. Yeah. Um, well, okay. Here's another story. Um, Alec Baldwin, one of the producers on, on the film called me speaking of corporate of crisis communications. Yeah. <laughs> I, won't name, I won't name the name of her, but it was a, a woman and Um, she, she did call me about some crisis communications because she was painted in a corner, um, just because her name was listed on the credits. Um, and somebody connected her to a man by the name of Jeffrey Epstein and said that she, um, had a relationship, uh, you know, was working with him and had dealings with him. And it wasn't the case. The reporter just didn't do their homework. And she wanted me to come and help her sort of get herself out of there. And I didn't end up doing it. Um, because I just didn't want to, I didn't want to touch that movie. I feel like that is super tainted. Um, and that's, you know, sometimes us publicists have to say no too. Um, but this woman was so, um, adamant that it was going to affect her overall uh, reputation. Um, and I, I, I advised her to get a lawyer. So sometimes as publicists, we advise people to get a lawyer. Um, so that's my little Alec Baldwin riff, but, um, I think that, you know, Alec and Will Smith, like, I mean, I know that Alec has a lot of mouths to feed, so he's going to work as hard as he can, as much as he can. Um, so I bet you somebody like that would have to go overseas and do like, 
you know, appearances and endorsements and mm-hmm. commercials just to make the money that he's used to making, because that's what happened when the whole me too thing happened. A lot of people left here and did things, did other projects or, you know, were, delved into things like crypto or whatnot so that they wouldn't have to, um, worry. And so I think that the, my best piece of advice for either one of them is to be off the grid and, you know, and then come back. America loves a comeback story, Mm -hmm. um, come back, but come back with, with some sort of social consciousness as opposed to just doing it just to do it. That's brilliant advice. And I think it's great. I always get concerned when someone won't stop talking. It's like, what you need to do is not put anything else on the record for a little while. Uh, you are a, uh, a boss lady running your own show. You're a mom, you're a wife. Yeah. How do you do it? How, what, what is work-life balance like for you? How do you manage it? Um, so that's a really interesting question. I think, you know, what's really interesting is a lot of people, um, when the pandemic happened, had trouble adjusting to working from home. Yeah. And, um, I'm sort of used to having my laptop and my phone be my office. And especially in the world that we're in now that I only would need to go to where I need to go to. So I know how to sort of come, you know, that's, I think that's one thing about being a publicist. You have to be able to compartmentalize things so that you're able to focus on one thing at a time. Yeah. And, you know, because my son goes to school, one of us will take him in the morning and then I'll work all day. And I, my, my best piece of advice is to carve out a little bit of time for yourself during the day, no matter what it is, um, whether it's to take a walk or to exercise or to go meet somebody for lunch, but you have to change up your routine. Otherwise you will stop being inspired and you won't feel stagnant. So I make sure to try to carve that in and I don't do it every day. Like but otherwise I would sit here for 12 hours and that's not healthy. Um, so balance is definitely important. So I, you know, I rely on my Peloton bike. Everybody has their own thing. (laughs) It helps me for stress in a way I can't explain to anyone, but it, it helps me balance it. And I'm grateful for that. And then I'll work till about three 45, maybe four o'clock. And then I'll go pick up my child and then he'll come home. And then, um, either I'll finish up, uh, you know, the things that can be finished up like within the 30 minutes. And then, um, I'm very lucky. My husband's a chef. So if I do the grocery shopping, he does the cooking. So that works out well. And then, um, after my son goes to sleep, I'll usually go back and try to catch up on a few things. So it's, it is hard to balance. I try really hard to not work on the weekends if I don't have to, unless there's an event or something going on. But I do find that, um, you know, the, the trick is like when I was single and I was on my own, I, you know, I can work for 15 hours a day, like no problem. But, you know, now the, there are four stops and the stops also help give me boundaries that I need. Yeah. It, the four stops are really true. You know, same thing with me when, when I was single, I was going all day and, uh, I have three kids. One just graduated college yes. uh, oh this, my God. this past weekend, which is incredible. Congratulations. Thank you. But what happens is, is you're right. You're in flow state. You're working. Now you got to go pick one of them up. And then wow. instead of going straight back home, like you think they're going to be like, Hey, I want to go to Chick-fil-A. And I'm like, oh, Okay. And now you're hungry. And then just all these things happen that keep you from having like a consistent, and it's also difficult, like as an artist too, because you need that sort of consistent two, three, four hour block to actually get great or reach a professional benchmark or anything. So I'm with you. It can be, it can be difficult, but I've always said this, it's super duper, duper rewarding. Uh, I'm going to hit you with a couple of quick questions and uh, get you out of here. Um, I'm curious, what are the two best pieces of advice you've received in your career so far and who did they come from? Um, one of the best pieces of advice I've gotten, um, was from a mentor of mine named Linda Lippman. She is one of the heads of a company called Hill six strategies. And she kind of taught me 
to take the emotion out of it. Mm. And what I mean by that is to not, you know, just because you're working on it. And, and I see this a lot with personal publicists, a lot of personal publicists, like for celebrities, I have a lot of dear friends that do it for a living. They think they're the celebrity. You know, oh. they love being on the red carpet. They, they they get to go on the jets and they get to, you know, experience the parties and whatnot where yeah. like, I'd rather be at home and I don't care anymore. Like I have that factor <laughs> of my life, but, um, so taking the emotion out of a situation, if you're stressed out, if you're worried, if, you know, I can understand, and I'm sure you can relate to this, having three kids and I only have one, like. I would get so nervous and so anxious. Like I was going to be late to pick up my kid or I was going to, or we were going to be late to school. And those emotions, like you can't, like, you'll never forget those in your life. Like always, like my biggest fear is always being late for him or, or, or being him being the last one picked up. And I'm sure that's every parent and there's no rules on that. And there's no advice, but you know, when it comes, so I think the other thing is after having a child, like you sort of realize like, you know what, that stuff wasn't so important. (laughs) (laughs) And, um, but it also kind of makes you realize like, um, that it's not really always going to work out, but if you just take the emotion out of it, at least you will have a little bit more of a calm as opposed to the people around you, let them all freak out. And then, um, the other piece of advice came from a very long time executive who literally, um, Ron Sato, who has like risen through the ranks, like nobody I know in my life. And I also consider him to be a, re- a mentor. He worked for people like Barry Diller and, um, launched his interact IAC companies and worked for USA network. And, you know, this was the, this was a very hard piece of advice to swallow, but it totally rings true. Not everyone's going to like you. Mm. Even if you are brought into a situation and, you're producing and delivering and everybody sees it. Not every, but you know, the head person might not like you. And I've, I've been in situations like that before. And just because they don't like you, it doesn't mean you don't know what you're doing. It's just there. They may be threatened by you. They may feel um, like they should have come up with that idea or they just might not like you because they don't like you. And as long as you're still producing and doing a great job, um, and put your head, like, sometimes I say, just put your head down and yeah. do the work. And then the nine times out of 10, you will achieve success. Yeah. I really agree with that. That second one would be really important for me too. I try too hard to make sure that everybody likes me and you know, I've had to come to realize that I need to say no, especially as a film investor. So many, like 99 times out of 100, and everybody takes that differently. And some people take it personally. They think it's personal. I've actually written scripts on how to say no in a soft, in the softest possible way, where there's still a relationship after I say no, but it's still, it's not fail safe, Amy. Like, yeah, yeah they hate you. <laughs> like like well, you, and they view you as someone that wasted their time or doesn't believe in them or whatever. It's like, sometimes it's a little backhanded though, too. Cause remember, like they might be threatened by you. Or they might, they might be like annoyed that you came up with the idea before they did, yeah. or you kind of jumped a step further and, you know, like, like in the perce- land of perception, like you don't want to look like a kiss ass, you know, either. Yeah. Um, you just want to look like you're doing the job. And, and, you know, I, a lot of producers are like this and you probably know this too. You also have to make it look like it's their idea sometimes. And that's mm-hmm. hard. It's very yeah. humbling. Yep. I'm really good at that though. <laughs> That's good. I had a That's lot of experience good. giving other people the credit. Um, Don't we what's all? the biggest, uh, exactly. What, what are the biggest creative and business mistakes you see your new clients making or newcomers to the business making? Um, one of the biggest things I tell people is don't be so fast to hire me because mm. um, sometimes they think that the, that getting PR will um, fix a situation and um, it doesn't. And sometimes they just need, they need the social media visibility first. Not everything. I mean, especially now, I mean, let's be honest. Most people barely can read a document. They want to read a Twitter text. They don't even want to, you know what I'm saying? It's it's very hard to engage people. Mm -hmm. So you need to, um, you know, really take a look, a closer look at at why, why do you need it? And because most of the time they don't even have the money for it. 
Mm-hmm. So if like, you have to sort of ask yourself, what, what am I trying to achieve here? So that's one thing. And, um, what was the other question? I forgot. Just business and creative mistakes. I think that would probably be the business mistake, right? That's the business mistake. The creative mistake is, um, and this probably happens a lot. Um, yeah, on your end too, is that a lot of people think that if they, that there's a compelling clip in a film or in a piece of content and you're like, I don't know what to do with that. Like there's nothing like to you, maybe in your eyes and in the people in your circle think it's like, Oh my God, this is really going to hit home. But you and I know, like it's going to just sit on a stack of things and nobody cares. So, um, that's hard. And you don't want it. Like I literally just had that happen the other day. I had, um, this client say to me, we gave you all this great faith and family footage. What happened to it? We haven't seen it posted anywhere. Well, all we can do is best laid plans. They could decide to take it down. Um, the outlets may not care, you know, so it's not just because you think it's great. It may not appeal to the masses. And that's, that's challenging. And so what I usually do in a situation like that is I say, you know, we've done our best to get it out there. If we get any nibbles, we'll let you know. Um, but one of my biggest challenges creatively that I find, and I said this a little bit earlier is that the people in my universe get very addicted to the attention. They get really addicted to, you know, 42 news, uh, television interviews in three months because I know how to get the news out there and people don't understand that. So that becomes a challenge and you have to figure out a way, um, you know, and I, I literally just happened, had this happen with, um, an author client of mine who I got him so many interviews and he's like, what do you mean? There's, I can't do anything else. And I'm like, it's, I didn't say that. It's just there's a, there's a beginning, a middle and an end and managing that is challenging. I completely agree. This has been so informative. You, you have wedged in so much valuable information in such a short period of time. I just know everyone listening is going to be so much better informed, not only on how to sort of prepare themselves for whatever they have planned for their future, but also have prepared themselves when they do go out and search for a publicist or they do go out and try to get someone to help because I'm totally with you. The one of the biggest mistakes that indie creatives make is they try to do everything themselves. There's a time to do that. Then there's a time to transition and, and, and ask for help. And so I think this conversation kind of bridges that gap. Can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media, on the internet, maybe even see, uh, where your businesses are and some of your works are. Okay. I have <laughs> embarrassed to tell you this. Um, I have a website. It's, um, the printer mm-hmm. And, um, my social media is printer underscore group is Instagram. And let's see, where are we on Twitter? <laughs> this is so embarrassing. I, <laughs> I just don't do it enough. And I'm terrible about that. Um, and my Twitter is at a printer. Um, and I definitely, I, I would say the most, you know, and especially for entertainment, I'll tell you, I, um, one of the one, another one, the last piece of advice I want to give you before I sign off here is, um, use your LinkedIn and use it a lot. Um, my LinkedIn profile is my sweet spot. And I, um, my LinkedIn handle is Amy Corrales, but, um, which is my married name, but I, I showcase all of my client work there and I get a lot of leads from there. Uh, People call me from that. They see it. And the reason why I find it to be so beneficial is because, um, a lot of people don't realize the value of it. And it is an, it's an, uh, it's, it's a great professional tool and everybody everybody has a need for it. Yeah. I think that's so true. I've really dove deep on my LinkedIn recently. It's, it's really oh, been linked into me for sure. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll be totally connected going this day forward, Amy. You're, okay, cool. you're, you're amazing. Um, I, I, I want to we'll, hear more about your, um, your films too offline for sure. Yeah. Let's and do that. And, and I think I have some other things to talk to you about as well. Um, we, we will end on this. You mentioned your husband, Lance, being a chef. Well, he's more than that. He's been a, 
you know, a private chef for Sean Combs. Uh, he's been executive chef at some of the top restaurants. For top restaurants in LA, Harrison Ford, um, like you just mentioned, I mean, what, what an incredible chef he must be. And I, I was just curious, does he ever let you cook anything? And if so, what is your go-to I do, but meal? I get, I get majorly anxiety ridden because I don't want to like screw it up. To be honest with you, it's really bad. Is there any dish that's like your go-to? Uh, that you think maybe you make better than he does even? Um, I did make banana bread better than him um, for like a minute, <laughs> for a minute. Anyway, thank you so much for this. It's been Absolutely. great. Absolutely, yeah. My goal was to get, to get you out of here on time. So I think we just about hit it, almost did. Awesome. All right, well, let's keep in touch, please, please, please. Absolutely. Take care of yourself. This has okay. been great. And we'll talk soon, Amy. Okay, thank you. Bye. Be good. Bye. Bye-bye. Hey, gang. One more thing before you go. I want to talk to you about Indie Insights. Indie Insights is our bi-weekly newsletter and love note to the film industry, movies, and the creatives that make them, not to mention you, our esteemed listeners. Inside, you'll find curated industry trends, articles, exclusive commentary, and underappreciated films from filmmakers like you worldwide. And the best part is that it's completely free. So join today at www.bonsai.film. It just takes a few seconds. And once you sign up, you'll get the very next newsletter. It's that simple. Go to www.bonsai.film to get into insights, our bi-weekly newsletter, and join a network of film creatives like yourself. And don't worry, we'll never sell your information or spam you with a bunch of nonsense emails. Just the bi-weekly film industry goodness you need. And if you ever tire of Indie Insights, we hope not. But if you do, simply unsubscribe. No gimmicks, no games. So, one more time, go to www.bonsai.film to get Indie Insights for free. And thank you for listening.